Should we do it? Hey everyone, me Kevin here. Should I run for governor or should we just share the ideas in this video as a really good solution that governors around our country should be considering for making our world a better place? Now, I don't exactly know the answer to this yet, but I can tell you one thing is for sure. If I were to become governor, I'd be the only governor making YouTube videos every day. They'd probably be more of vlog style, but I would be the most transparent governor that would exist and you'd have my commentary every single day. I'd probably have a team of editors and filmers that I would personally pay for just following me around. So that way in between meetings or coffee breaks or whatever, I could give you the lowdown on what the heck is going on, not only in the state, but my comments on what's going on elsewhere <laughs> in the country. So for now though, let's focus on the ideas and these ideas I think can really work nationally. So if you're watching this video thinking, ah, is this only applying to California? I encourage you to give this a listen and maybe add your feedback because some of these ideas are things that we could see in other parts of the country as maybe, and hopefully other governors adopt some of these ideas. Maybe this becomes more of a national idea or national movement. And this is not a movement dedicated to a political party. This is a movement dedicated towards the future of our country, our future generations, and in my opinion, just really good ideas. <laughs> it's something that uh, I feel like politics has kind of been ingrained to not think about, not think about new ideas. And that's what I'm bringing to the table are new ideas and plans to execute them. Now, what I'm going to go through here is a 20 part plan, and I'm going to have a breakdown of the uh, timestamps for the different plans uh, in the description down below. So that way you can jump around to the different parts. Uh, they definitely vary in length. <laughs> but anyway, the question here is, is it worth running with this kind of platform or is it just worth sharing the idea? Either way, the best way you can help me out is by sharing this video. If you know somebody who lives anywhere in the country and you like even one part of this plan, share this plan. I wanna hear from you and I wanna hear from the folks you are sharing it with. Let's get started. Part number one for fixing California. California taxes are too high. COVID has proven that you don't need to live in a specific state to work in a specific state. This means people are literally fleeing California, especially uh, higher income individuals, paying sales taxes and property taxes and potentially income taxes in different states or no income taxes in different states by fleeing to states like Texas, Florida, Nevada, Idaho, and avoiding California taxation altogether. That means not only are we losing the income tax from those individuals, but we're also losing car registrations, license registrations or renewals, or losing in uh, sales taxes and property taxes. We're losing a lot from these individuals. And this trend has a real risk of bleeding California dry. I mean, we're already seeing Tesla not only threaten to move to Texas, but establish their next gigafactory in Texas. This is bad. We can't have companies, especially big tech companies, leaving our state because they contribute so much to our California GDP. California's cracks of this happening are already starting to show and it's a big problem. So my solution, solution number one, completely eliminate all taxes for those making less than $250,000 per year. For those above this range and to be determined, there should be a flat tax of somewhere between five to 7%. And we don't even need the California Franchise Tax Board to do this. We should just abolish the Franchise Tax Board altogether. And I know that sounds radical, but quite frankly, we need less bureaucracy because we're gonna have to work on saving a lot of money. So there's gonna be a lot of saving money that needs to happen at the government to not have a state income tax. But quite frankly, we can all do with a little less bureaucracy. And in this 20 part plan, you're gonna see how I come up with generating this additional revenue because quite frankly, Frankly, it's cheap talk to say, let's get rid of income taxes without a plan. Well, I got a 20 part plan. <laughs> let's keep going on this. So to make this clear, for anyone making under $250,000, you would pay zero. Anyone making over $250,000, you would be taxed at a flat tax rate of between five to 7% to be determined uh, on any amount above $250,000. So it'd still be zero for anything below 250. Uh, and this would be assessed on your federal taxable income. So you wouldn't need to do a California tax return, but just look at your IRS 1040, which you could send to us digitally and boom, there you go. Here's your fee. <laughs> it's that simple. Things can be done very simply in government. They don't need to be as complicated as they are. Anyway. The same will be true for small businesses. So small businesses, individuals making under $250,000 will pay zero in California taxes and file no California tax related fees. But again, just eliminating the California tax without a plan for replacing $100 billion in revenue annually is cheap talk. So let's talk about this. First, as part of part one here, taxing those just making over $250,000 at around five to 7%, it will likely raise over $25 billion in tax revenue annually. That means 
already with this one change, we may have lost that $100 billion in revenue, but we've already filled the pot back up with about $25 billion in revenue. And, and again, that's $100 billion in revenue is what the state brings in uh, annually from income taxes. We're going to fill that pot back up with $25 billion dollars just by taxing those making over on the amounts over $250,000 at 5 to 7% to be determined exactly where. But anyway, uh, anyone, and this is sort of another thing that we'll do, uh, anyone who has already left California within the last 10 years will be invited back and will be given a 50% tax abatement on any income over $250,000 for the first three years they're back. So that way, our goal is to bring some of these entrepreneurs and higher income earners back to California. So if they're gone, you go from making money to making no money. If you bring them back at a 50% discount, at least you're going from zero to something. <laughs> and hopefully they stay as we have a more accommodating business uh, related or, or business inspired uh, taxation structure in California. We got to fix California. Now, there are many other problems, okay? We got to talk about housing, transportation, traffic, and let's get into this. So part two, California has a massive housing problem. We have way too few homes, and that is the simple problem. We have too few homes. Hopes, homes take uh, too long to build, and the permitting process via building and safety departments is too expensive and time consuming. For example, California has laws that accessory dwelling units should be permitted within 60 days, yet most cities just ignore these rules and they end up taking six months. I know this because I'm one of those people waiting six months for a guest unit. Solving the housing problem can be done in four phases. And then I'm going to talk about transportation because trust me, if we're going to talk about housing, we have to talk about transportation too, okay? Phase one, free permits. Literally free permits that anyone can pull online through the state with no punitive action for previously unpermitted items. Trust me, as someone who began business in the state as a real estate broker, nobody wants to pull a permit because it is so punitive, cost prohibitive, and time intensive. And everyone who owns a house is probably nodding their head going, yep, I hate the building safety department. Yeah, because it's not functional. There are too many issues in our state, and this holds up building and safety. It actually makes our state less safe by having such a punitive and aggressive building and safety department. What we need is to work with people the right way and in a safe way, in a way that they won't be bogged down for months in planning, arguing over where the darn smoke detectors go. With simplified guides, infographics attached to permits, 90% of projects can be permitted online within 24 hours and afterwards we'll have simple collaborative inspections. The amount of time people will save will more than make up any potential slight modifications they might have to make after an inspection because every single day that real estate sits vacant, people generally lose one to $500 a day sitting around waiting for building and safety departments to act. That is ridiculous. Phase two. We need faster remodel permits. Now, that's different from some of these other permits. There are a lot of things that we can, can be permitted over the counter, but then there are larger remodel permits that generally require architects and engineers. Yet here's an irony. Why is it that the state licenses architects and engineers? So the state certifies engineers and architects to work in the state of California. Yet architects and engineers together do not have the power to authorize you to begin a remodel. That's a big problem. So we're gonna change that. Together, we're going to completely change the way building and safety works. Architects and engineers who already take liability for the plans they put together will simply certify that their plans meet code, which means less architects and engineers just throwing spaghetti against the wall, hoping it sticks or letting building and safety do the heavy lifting for them. Instead, licensed architects and engineers will put their license and their liability protections on the plans that they certify meet California codes, which will be simplifying California codes as well to make this much more streamlined. And then subject to a seven day audit by local building officials, and this is gonna be more like a gut check on it, okay, double checking, there will be remodels that can begin virtually immediately. That means no more waiting three to 12 months to get a plan check back because you're waiting for 10 different departments to shuffle through your plans, which your architects and engineers should have done already. It, this is a backwards system, the way things exist now. Why do we bother having a licensing system when we can't even empower our architects and engineer to solve our remodeling problems? Then we get to phase three, new construction and guest units. We should streamline these through the state. 
Rather than builders submitting plans for guest units or new construction homes in each city, builders should get authorization to build homes statewide. I invite home builders to come to the state and in one swoop, open up massive plan approvals throughout the state to open up massive parts of California for new construction with standardized floor plans, especially inland and in a low population areas where more land is available to develop and grow into. We need more houses in more places. It's that simple. Without more houses, people either leave California or they end up suffering into a poverty trap. And that is unacceptable in California. Housing should not be as unaffordable as it is. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying go to Los Angeles and just double the amount of housing we have in Los Angeles. We've got too many, too many people in Los Angeles already. What we need is more housing in different parts of the state and for areas within Los Angeles or big cities like San Francisco, we need to streamline remodel processes so that homes don't sit vacant or as fixer uppers for years upon years as nobody can get them through building and safety departments. So of the housing we have, we gotta get people in it. And then we need to add housing to areas that don't currently have housing while at the same time protecting our agricultural resources. We have plenty of beautiful land and we need to start making it easy to develop these lands again. If Vegas can build in the desert, we can build in the beautiful lands of California. But not only that, I want you to do this. Look around California and ask yourself, how many malls and strip malls and commercial buildings are closed? And how many of them are not coming back? How quickly can we easily redevelop these into homes and townhomes? That way, you're not worried about taking more land, maybe in downtown Los Angeles or San Diego and turning it into, uh, you know, removing, let's say, a park and turning it into housing. We don't want to do that. We want more green spaces. But let's take abandoned strip malls and actually turn them into townhomes and streamline the redevelopment of this process. Now, don't worry, we'll have to address traffic, which we're going to address in, in a moment, because traffic in our cities is definitely a big problem. Nobody wants to even think about going on the 405 because it's toxic. It's more toxic than the video game Rust. But the bottom line here is we need less bureaucracy and streamlined processes to incentivize housing construction as soon as possible. We are in a housing crisis. Housing is too expensive. And I know that we have a lumber shortage right now and extremely high lumber prices, but don't worry. In time, supply chain shortages will resolve themselves and housing will get constructed. Phase four, by focusing on redeveloping unused commercial space and streamlining remodels and new construction in the state, we'll actually need to focus less on quote, low income housing. Instead, we'll just focus on more housing because more housing in underdeveloped areas gives people an opportunity to move to these areas within California so that rather than leaving California, they could be in different areas of California with new construction homes and they could begin to build their wealth. The reality is people stuck in section eight or in rent controlled apartments or units, they don't end up building their wealth. They end up stuck dependent on California's affordable housing laws and they never end up building their wealth through real estate. The reality is the best way to build wealth in America, at least one of the best ways to build wealth in America is by home ownership or through home ownership. Owning a home is a great way and we will incentivize building wealth in California not trying to survive being dependent on the state of California. I wanna be clear, we're not going to get rid of Section 8 or low-income housing that we already have. So there will be protections in place for what's already existing. We'll simply incentivize opportunities for you though, or for anybody in a situation to actually begin to build wealth and get out of the trap that they're in via the state of California. We'll also eliminate costly regulations that make it more expensive to build in California or to redevelop. And we'll partner with companies like SpaceX to provide high-speed internet and reach more newer homes in California through perhaps their Starlink system. We'll also work with companies like Enphase and Tesla so we can make sure our grid is more resilient, not only when fires occur, but for the more homes that we have. Part number three, 
we're gonna have to pay a little bit for this housing transformation. I expect this housing transformation will benefit all landowners and real estate owners, as we'll have much more streamlined renovation and building processes, giving real estate investors more of an opportunity to renovate quicker, better, and safer, and giving more developers opportunities to build, giving apartment building owners more of an opportunity to redevelop commercial spaces to residential spaces. But what we're going to do is we're going to have a small fee. Instead of people paying building permits, they'll be saving money with this small fee. There will simply be a small fee of about three to $600 per housing unit owned. Now don't worry, 99% of homeowners are gonna save way more money by having no income tax and then be worried about this three to $600 a year. It works out to 25 to $50 per month. It's a drop in the bucket for individuals. But here's the beauty. California has over 14 million housing units. I wanna see that go up substantially. At 14 million housing units, however, we'll raise $4.3 to $8.6 billion for the state. That helps us fill our bucket from 25 to oh, potentially over $30 billion. This is how we get rid of the state income tax slowly but surely. With the average home in California gaining $9,000 per year in value, this is a drop in the bucket. To fund permits and you get better benefits, you're paying to have a better state permitting system, a safer system, and a better, more accommodative real estate ownership system. And you're actually saving money because we're not gonna be having income taxes for the vast majority of people living in California. Part four, we do have to talk about transportation. Transportation is a problem and we need much, much better transportation. I propose that instead of spending money on a very expensive high-speed rail line, and spend billions of dollars on such a rail, rail line, we instead work with innovators like Elon Musk or any other company who wants to build tunnels far below into the bedrock of our state in safe ways, geologically safe ways, build tunnels under densely populated areas to connect densely populated cities like San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, Santa Barbara, not through the 405 or the I-5 or the 101, but through tunnels to get people from cities to the new homes that they live in, potentially outside the cities in the new areas that we develop or wherever they want. We need tunnels to solve our traffic crisis. We can't build more highways along our coastline. Look at the city of Ventura destroyed by a massive highway that separates the downtown from the beach? It's ridiculous. We need less people sitting in traffic on highways. We need more people using tunnels as a fast, efficient way of traveling through California. And we will make that happen in California. And we're not gonna solve that with Caltrans. We're gonna solve that with a smaller Caltrans supervising private industries to solve our transportation problems. Tunnels might potentially charge a small fees in the form of a toll, kind of like Florida does, but it ends our traffic nightmare because the people who are willing to pay a small fee can use the tunnels, and those who don't wanna pay the small fee can use the regular roads that we have now, which will hopefully be much less impacted. And since we're trying to incentivize more people to stay in California and come to California, we need more transportation. We need more transportation avenues. And this is the best way to solve that. Those, again, who can't afford those smaller potential fees on tolls will either have programs for helping subsidize those lower income individuals or will create ways for them to use uh, above ground infrastructure or they could just use the potentially more empty highways as mentioned. All right, now part five. This is a big one. Since Joe Biden plans to make community college free, I propose that 70% of California high schools and community college, not all of them, not 70% of them, maybe more, be merged and turned into what I call four year future schools. Future schools are optional. This means if someone wants to go to a traditional high school and then to a traditionally community college, they can. That avenue will still be available. However, future schools will operate very differently. Future schools will pay teachers $120,000 or more per year, more than tripling teacher salaries. Future schools will operate like this. At 14 years old, students will have the choice to attend a future school or a normal school. Future schools will blend community college and high school. They will prepare students for the real world. 
We will produce software engineers, mechanical engineers, cannabis growers. We'll produce genomic researchers, technicians, therapists, nurses, salespeople, entrepreneurs, business folks. This means at 14, students will have their curriculum catered to what potentially their career path might become. The first two years between 14 and 16 might be more generally focused on business and personal finance. And those years between 17 and 18 might be more catered towards actual hands-on training. So for example, if you're becoming a nurse, you might not need to learn calculus, but you'll learn about building wealth through investing and you'll learn how to be a nurse. So that way by 18, you'll be able to get a job as a nurse. By 18, you'll be ready to be a Palantir engineer at the FBI. At 18, you'll be ready for a job at Tesla, Google, or Apple. How? Well, with real work study and in collaboration with these companies. We'll ask companies to integrate our students into their real work environments. This isn't a trade school. It's the next level. It's the best of both. It's the best of actually all three, high school, trade school, and community college. It's a merger of all of them. And we'll reduce costs by working with companies like Teachable and highly paid teachers to teach courses online. And no, I'm not talking about stupid Zoom meetings. I'm talking about structured educational lectures that can be filmed and played online so that way teachers don't waste their time giving the same lecture hundreds of times when they could just have a recording playing that lecture and students could then slow it down or speed it up or replay it. And then we'll have in-person study, in-person hands-on lessons, in-person hands-on learning with the companies and places that students might end up wanting to work with. They'll learn the real world and they'll actually learn how to build their wealth at the same time. We'll do real world projects. We're going to build the future, one student at a time. Well, right now, our California educational system has failed us. Think about it. Right now, somebody who graduates at 18 has a hard time getting a job at McDonald's. We complain about needing a minimum wage, yet our workers don't have skills because our schools have failed them. Think about it. We need an army of certified programmers, licensed handy people, CPAs, certified financial planners, engineers, architects, salespeople, business folks, nurses, you name it, earlier than ever before and for less money. Also, since community college is likely to be free under Joe Biden, we'll expect to fund most of our future schools with federal government funding. And since our future schools will merge high school and community college and use technology to scale, we expect to operate future schools as an extremely cost-effective, high-quality institution. Capable individuals will be able to enroll for free and will do so for a fraction of what we spend on schooling today. Capable homeless individuals and undocumented folks will also be able to enroll and those undocumented individuals will be able to earn their way to citizenship and the federal government will pay for it. In addition, future schools will give homeless individuals an opportunity to finally build their dignity. I expect to reduce our state expenditures on college and high school by the tune of 30 to $50 billion a year with the aid of the federal government paying for community college, AKA our future schools. And by transforming how our school system functions. This combined with our flat tax, our lower infrastructure burdens, and a small fee on housing units will almost completely make up the need to have a state income tax for people making under $250,000 at all. So at the same time as we lower taxes, we can have more homes, better transportation, more highly skilled individuals earlier. Folks, California will become an example for the real world. Future schools will utilize a mix of lecture hall style, hands-on teaching and pre-recorded teacher-led coursework online and in person. That way, rather than teachers sitting on a Zoom call, we do technology the way it's meant to be done. We do future schools the way they're meant to be done, giving people a practical hands-on education and a lecture education the way they deserve to have it. This, folks, is how we end poverty. This is how we begin to reduce the wealth gap. This will fix not only our schools, but will provide huge benefits for our Latino, Black, and minority communities to help build wealth for free and while paying lower taxes along the way. Everyone will be on an equal playing field at 18. Part six, 
Homelessness will be eliminated. Any homeless person capable will be offered assisted enrollment in future schools and housing so we can make our homeless population productive and reintegrate them into society, providing them dignity. For the mentally ill and disabled, other solutions, of course, will be provided. But for the able, people want to work. People don't want to be homeless living on our streets. This is unacceptable. There will be no more homelessness on the streets of California when future schools open. Part seven, we will work directly and partner with companies like Tesla, UPS, FedEx, Google, Apple, Facebook, Patagonia, Amgen, you name it, and many other massive industries in our state to find out what is it that they need the most to make California the most business-friendly state in the country. We will rally the people who generate the GDP in this country and find out what do they need from their government to make California a better place. Does this mean corporate liability protections while maintaining consumer rights with faster building permits for new factories or new uh, campuses for Apple or whatever it may be? California will meet with businessmen and women more than California meets with politicians. We will run California like a business. We'll also encourage clean mining like rare earth mining so that we can compete with China and use our rich lands in clean ways. Part eight. This one might be a little bit more controversial, and this one is still to be determined. We also have 12 more parts in this, so <laughs> if you don't like this part so much, you can skip by this part. But anyway, on gun safety, particularly handguns, the reality is there are millions of guns on the street that we know nothing about. In fact, during this recording, there was a shooting in Wisconsin. Anyone can carry a gun in this country, and 99% of individuals who carry guns are completely unknown to the state. And this is a problem, and this happens in California, this happens everywhere. There's a lot of illegal gun use. And so my proposal is that we expand California's access to legally owned guns safely with multiple tiered licenses based not on a fee or a waiting period, but based on hours of training. Folks, I don't want somebody with two hours behind a gun holding a gun like the next person. Now, we're not going to take away gun rights as much as they've already been taken away in California, but I want to instead incentivize people to have the opportunity to train and gain special privileges in exchange for the hours of training that they conduct. Lawful citizens with hundreds of hours of gun training, potentially thousands of hours of gun training, today find it nearly impossible to apply for a concealed carry license. This is a sin. This is ludicrous and ridiculous. For people who make the investment into safe and trained gun ownership, I'm talking handguns here, California will issue licenses. Part nine, on climate change. First, with our flat tax on those making over $250,000 in future schools, I expect over 70% of our California budget will be solved for. To fund the rest, California will investigate a potential carbon tax on polluting industries to become one of the first states to implement a carbon tax. This will fulfill a carrot and stick approach. Future schools will provide skilled workers, while companies will be heavily incentivized to clean up their carbon footprint using those workers, helping us reduce the impact of climate change in our state and begin to mitigate the dreaded California fire season. This will incentivize a clean environment privately. California doesn't need to force climate change on people and companies. Instead, it's simple. If you pollute more than your peers as a business, you're incentivized to green up your operations or cap and trade carbon tax credits. Part 10. By the way, I do expect that to fulfill potentially even more than the tax revenue we had previously with an income tax. This is a massive benefit, even for the companies who would be getting taxed, because there are certain industries that are like, ah, crap, I don't like that, Kevin. Well, those companies are still going to benefit because all of their workers are essentially going to be getting a pay raise via no state income tax for those making under $250,000. Every business in this state will get a pay raise by having their workers not pay taxes on income of $250,000 or less. That actually makes it easier for you to maintain your employees and not lose them to other states. Part 10, we're gonna change the DMV. Nobody likes the DMV, and it's because the DMV is broken. So we're gonna close the DMV. Instead, DMV certified private companies, private supervised by the state, will administer driving tests and training both virtually and at people's individual locations. Or maybe there'll be a storefront that uh, private companies can administer driving tests in. Maybe we'll even have a location that are, that are dedicated driving test loops rather than somebody 
driving around a parking lot or getting on and off an on-ramp on a highway. They can drive through an actual course that we can develop. We can actually use cones! When has anybody ever actually used cones in a driving test? I certainly didn't in California. So we will also have virtual driver licenses. So in coordination with better testing, testing that isn't stupid and doesn't suck via the DMV, we're gonna have virtual licenses that will become available so that way you always have your ID with you because most of us have our cell phone with us. We need virtual IDs, virtual IDs that folks who need to check your age, for example, for alcohol, gambling, or other purposes can simply scan a QR code on your phone and verify that you are of age. It's that simple. You don't need to issue plastic ID cards anymore. We could save that money. We're in 2021. We're also going to eliminate pulling people over for speeding anywhere in this state. Now that sounds crazy. We don't want to incentivize speeders, right? <laughs> don't worry, we won't. We're gonna use speed cameras throughout our highways and other parts of the state. So that way, not only do we have a potential other revenue source for those who desire to speed can pay a slight tax. I mean, it'll be a substantial tax. We don't wanna incentivize people speeding because it's unsafe, but people who do end up speeding anyway will pay their fair share because they are a potential risk to our society. And so we will have speed cameras that undiscriminately will photograph license plates of cars speeding and those speeding tickets will simply show up on people's virtual driver licenses. So that way you can simply open up your virtual driver's license and get a notification that you've got a ticket and pay it right there with your credit card, whatever. You don't have to do anything. We're going to make it simple. We're gonna make it very simple to solve problems in our state. Because here's why. Right now, when an officer pulls someone over on the highway or on a road, what happens? All traffic slows down. Traffic slows down way below the speed limits we create traffic jams. This causes more transportation problems. In fact, oftentimes we see highway traffic come to a complete stop when somebody gets pulled over because we create massive bottlenecks. Officer safety on busy roads is also a top priority of mine and freeing the flow of traffic is an added benefit. Getting traffic stops off roads by not having traffic stops on roads. In fact, speeding traffic stops will be eliminated. Other traffic stops will still be possible, but they will be directed off highways. No more traffic stops on highways. Just pull off at the next exit and conduct your traffic stop there. That's safer for officers, it's safer for drivers, and it's much more efficient. And it helps foster faster transportation in our state. We will also have a better transportation system, which I expect we will work very closely with the CHP on. And I wouldn't be surprised that we end up increasing funding for the CHP to help us with our transition, especially with our tunnel system. Part 11, the California Contractor Board will create a handy person license and multiple other licenses that can be obtainable through future schools. That way at 18, people can become a licensed handy person, something you can't be right now. That way people can become a licensed plumber or a licensed electrician through a future school. We'll also have multiple new licenses obtainable at these future schools so we can create the jobs that we will need. We're going to have a housing transition, so we need to train electricians, plumbers, handy folk, roofers, attorneys, real estate agents, you name it. And the best way to do it will be through our future schools. Part 12, all state services will immediately accept cryptocurrency as a form of payment. And we will plan to work with private companies to create a payment portal through our virtual driver license system. So that way, if you need to renew your real estate license at the same time as your driver's license, at the same time as maybe pay a fee or fine, it can all be done through your virtual driver license or if you don't have a driver license, through your virtual ID card. Everyone gets an ID card in California. And we're not gonna print those ID cards anymore. They're gonna be virtual. Heck, maybe we can even make it so that you can upload or link your IRS 1040 tax return from the federal government directly through the system to streamline your relationship with the government through one simple to use app. You wanna pay your California income tax because you make over, over $250,000 through cryptocurrency? Fine by us. We wanna make it simple for you to work with the state not a pain in the frickin' butt, which it is now. Part 13, most welfare programs today require working. Well, we're gonna reform welfare to save billions of dollars by enrolling welfare recipients into future schools and get them a path to a real job with real dignity and real pay. We're not going to reduce welfare benefits. Everything's gonna stay the same with welfare, except rather than 
having to have a job, you'll have the choice of going to a future school. And if you go to a future school and you become a licensed handy person, all of a sudden you're making more money and you don't need welfare anymore, then it's this win-win. California saves on welfare recipient expenses. California saves on Medi-Cal because as more people earn money, less people have to be on Medi-Cal, which saves billions of dollars for the state. Billions and billions of billions of dollars will be saved for our state. We potentially will even reduce the income tax or fees that we have throughout the state on other things like driver registrations or other fees because I think we're gonna have so much more money in the state when we actually operate it properly because we're going to get people on a path to real dignity and real pay. The way to reduce welfare, Medi-Cal, and government subsidy expenses is by training them to make more money. It's that simple. Most people don't wanna be on welfare. Most people don't want a handout from the government. California failed them. It's California's fault. It's not their fault. It's not their fault they can't get a job. It's California's fault, and we're gonna fix that. Part 14. We will expedite the processing of the federal child tax credit that Biden will pay for, which is his expectation, and he plans to make that permanent through 2025, and we're gonna take advantage of every penny of the federal, uh, that the federal government gives us, any more than any government has done before. We'll qualify for any potential incentive we can. And we might even increase the child tax credit so that students, once they turn 14, have an additional incentive to attend our future schools by potentially receiving a bonus if they choose to attend a future school on top of that child tax credit for children between 14 and 18 years old or under 18 years old. We'll have to see what the text of Joe Biden's law is. Part 15, we will increase community policing. And no, I'm not talking about more cops on more or inside of more patrol cars patrolling lower income areas even more. No, we're going to increase community policing via supervised community service for nonviolent crime by criminals who are in jail, again, for nonviolent instances. We will reduce jail expenses and at the same time provide supervised community service. This means rather than having more cops on the street or more cops in jail, we have more officers who would ordinarily be sitting around watching jail cells on the streets of our communities who need the help. Supervising, community involvement, community cleanup, community presence, making our community neighborhoods safer. Well, I don't care if we have to paint street numbers or tighten the screws on street signs or sweep the sidewalks or trim the hedges. We will make our high crime communities safer with community policing by and via the people who would otherwise be sitting in jail who are nonviolent offenders doing nothing. They will make our community safer. Just the presence, even throughout the night, just the presence of having community service individuals in our neighborhoods will make our communities safer. This means increasing the amount of community service aids and integrating with our communities. Policing in America is an us versus them. Policing has become a thankless and deadly job, and racial tensions are at unacceptable levels due to too many bad apples ruining our trust in policing. It's time to rebuild trust from the ground up. With new community service aides and regular community service and jailers, instead of being in jail, being in communities, cleaning up our communities and making them better, removing graffiti, removing trash, whatever it takes, that is what we're going to do. We will have a clean, golden state again. There will be no more homeless on streets. There will be no more graffiti. There will be no more trash on our streets in California. This will become a golden state like it once was. And there is no sense in people sitting around doing nothing. We can make much better use of them. Part 16, we'll reform our civil litigation system. Our small claims court system, instead of having the small claims limitation of $10,000, will have its small claims litigation system raised to $100,000 so that all claims for under $100,000 in damages will be handled directly through small claims processing, allowing attorneys to focus on substantial claims over $100,000. So existing attorneys who today pretty much end up charging in excess of $100,000 for a full lawsuit anyway, can focus on those bigger cases. Instead, people who want 
to litigate the vast majority of legal cases under $100,000 in damages, will have the opportunity to work directly with the legal process and solve their problems in front of a California judge or arbiter for claims of under $100,000. And so we will have small claims preside over all of these cases, and we will also create a brand new specialized bar license for small claims of up to $100,000 in litigation via future schools. There's another example of why the future schools will come into handy. People will be able to graduate a future school with the ability to be a small claims counsel. That means they will be an attorney that can specifically and is legally authorized to advise people going through the small claims process. That way, people coming out of a future school who want to get law experience can do so working on smaller litigation. Now, small claims will still not have attorneys allowed in court. There will be no attorneys in small claims court just like there are today, but there will be advisory services that we can license. Again, via small claims counsel services, which will be sort of a step to your full bar license and will give you an opportunity to get real hands-on experience. Part 17, California gasoline prices are insane. And this is in part because we're so worried about forcing a green transition that we're banning fracking and limiting the exploration of hydrocarbons, oils, and clean natural gases too early. This is leading to our grid to fail during fire season. This is leading to higher gas prices, which tax our individuals unfairly. Green energy still has a long way to go. We're going to foster a green transition over the next 10 years with our carbon tax, with our simplified building and infrastructure projects. We're going to simplify the process. We are going to make green possible in California. But we're not going to twist people's arms. We will have incentives, but we are not going to tax them at the pump or by having utilities fail. We need sustainable energy long term but we're not going to transition away from safe, clean natural gas and fracking as necessary to make sure that we can keep gas prices as low as possible and make sure we have maximum grid reliability. I, as much as the next person, want to make sure that we have a green future, but we can't do that by having our grids fail and people get ripped off at the pumps. We have to do it sustainably. Part 18, California should legalize and tax online and in-person gambling and incentivize the construction and development of casinos throughout the state. Why go to Vegas if you could now have a casino in Santa Monica, San Diego, San Francisco, Lake Tahoe, Big Bear, you name it. In time, online and in-person gambling could exceed five to $10 billion of state revenue. Folks, I told you we're going to operate the state like a business. I'm tired of seeing tax dollars go to Vegas. It's not my problem. It's a California problem. Folks, California needs a more competitive business environment, lower state income taxes. As a result, we're going to foster higher revenues by opening up more opportunities. And that's why we're going to legalize online gambling and in-person gambling in the state of California. Part 19, we will lower the cannabis age from 21 to 18. We will remove some of the barriers and limitations for the purchase and sale of cannabis. So that way we can not only incentivize more construction of dispensaries, more competition, but we could also quite frankly tax more cannabis sales because after all, not only are we going to save money with future schools and once future schools take effect, we'll end up having lower Medi-Cal costs because less people will be on Medi-Cal, less people will be on welfare. We'll be saving a lot of money in this state. We'll be saving money uh, in many different ways. But this is going to be one of the ways that we're going to raise additional revenue. Maybe our uh, new casinos that we build in California will have authorization to include cannabis dispensaries and cannabis smoking areas. Who knows? There are endless opportunities here, and I will make sure to look into all of the avenues to make it easier to do business in the state of California. Part 20 we are going to have a transition bond you can invest in. This will give us the funding as a state that the state will need to get through our transition. We will create this California transition bond to raise the money that we need to fund the transition away from ending the state income tax, which will end in 2022. This will be the first 
bond at a competitive rate so our California individuals can not, or investors, can earn higher rates of interest on their investments into our transition. And we're going to pay for those interest rates with our much more competitive, business-friendly structure in California. California will be a golden state again. And with all of the new revenue sources that we will create, California will be a fair and phenomenal place to do business and to live while not getting ripped off at the pump by your building and safety department, by your schools ripping you off. We're gonna make the state more efficient. We're gonna save so much money. And along the way, I'm going to vlog and document the entire process of every day that I'm in office, if I'm in office, if I run, to show you how we make this transition happen. This is going to happen. I am so confident that we can make this happen one day. Hopefully, it's soon. If you found this helpful, or if you found this interesting, consider sharing this video. That's all I ask, is that you share this video. Let me know what you think in the comments down below if you'd like, but most importantly, share the video. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.